adding in our chasing enemy we have a enemy class that's been stubbed out so it at least puts the image of the enemy on screen using the enemy image object which has been loaded with in this case death so it's now going to chase it when it first comes up the player can move but the enemy has no clue what's going on based on our discussion it shows us we need to figure out how to get the information of the player to the enemy the easiest way to do that is we can just pass that information directly to the enemy's update statement so I can just say player dot x comma player dot y so what I'm going to do is when we call the enemy's update line it's now going to receive values from the player so it's okay for our main class to tell other classes about other classes but it would be considered very rude if inside our enemy class if I were to do something like blah 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 player dot x if I were to actually just put that in directly in the class so one class is directly accessing a property or variable of another class that's considered really bad manners uh, it's a bad programming technique you really want classes to you can give them information so they have something to work with but they should not be able to independently access a different classes or objects variables that's considered very bad manners well that will sometimes work it will often fail and it will generally cause issues down the road now those x and y values we're feeding to it we know are float values so if I'm putting parameters in to a function here it makes sense to then uh, we have to define them and we know they're floating values and I'll just use the shorthand version of px and py to get them a value so my main class says hey when we call update we're going to give you two numbers and my enemy class now that function is now looking for those two values so it will receive them so when we call enemy update it's now going to receive two numbers and it can do something with those numbers which is actually really cool so what we'll do is we'll just build in part of it to begin with and then as we prove that that works then we'll flesh it out into our full kind of chasing algorithm that we need. But first we'll just go, hey, yes, we got it, so we can move to it. Um, so to do this, I like doing the method where we close the larger gap first. So if the x is difference between our x values if the player x versus enemy x is greater it tries to close that if the y values are further apart it tries to close that first I like that type of visual but you're welcome to reverse it if you decide you want to close the small gap first and then close the large gap it's not really going to matter but what we have to do is we have to figure out well which gap is bigger is it going to be the difference in our x's or difference in our y's and we're able to figure out that by, we'll put it in a, and I'm going to write it out first in English and then I'll just comment it out and write it in code. So if our difference of x is greater than of y. So when we write something out like that in English sometimes it makes it a little bit easier to put it into programming into actual like code so if the difference in X well and so when I have a line like this I'm actually you know when I'm done I'll end up I'll just comment it out but I can write this so it's commonly referred to in your book and elsewhere this is we're writing pseudocode we're writing it in plain language and then we'll rewrite it to actually using programming so difference of x really can be summed up as saying if we take the player's x 
and subtract from that the enemy's x. So is the difference in our x greater than our difference in our y's? So difference meaning subtraction. Once I know the difference in my x's, difference in y's, we just have to make sure we're getting the true value or absolute value. And the way that we're able to do that is we can refer to it as ABS. We're getting our ab work out here as an absolute. So if the absolute value of x is greater than the absolute value and the difference in my y's, then I'm going to want it to start moving in an x manner. So with that we can go and even put it into a full-on conditional. Nice pretty curly braces and all that good stuff. So if the absolute value of my difference of x is greater than the absolute value of my difference of y, at that point, the enemy is farther away on the x-axis. Now, the trick here is then figuring out, well, do we want the en enemy to now start moving to the left or to the right to close that gap? So this is where, once again, we need to do a little bit of calculating. But we don't actually have to use absolute because we want to know is the difference a positive or negative value. So now we can say if my px is greater than x. So if the player's x is greater than the x, which in this case, all when we're in the, inside the enemy class, x and y refer to the enemy's x and the enemy's y. So if we just see a plain x and plain y right now in this class, that means we're in reference to the enemies. So if the player's x is greater than the enemy's x, that would signify to us that what we need to do is set speed x equal to, and we can choose a number, we'll just choose a starting value of 1, and we'll see if that's a decent amount or not, and based on how the project runs, decide if we need to make it higher, lower, or whatever the case may be. So. Conversely, then, we know that, well, if the player's x is greater than the enemy's x, we want the speed x to become 1. But the opposite would be that we can infer if the player's x is not greater than the enemy's x, that means we need to make it go to the left instead of zooming off to the right, so our speed x will have to be set equal to negative 1. Now, what we can do at this point is we can even just try and run this and see how it plays. And depending on where the player is, we can see you know, every time I cross you know, kind of zero and make our x or y different, we can see how it's now starting to chase the player. But our enemy can't go up and down right now, so it gets a little bit unhappy. But it runs into problems. It's like, well, hmm. And it keeps moving until it ch the equations change. So if proven, it can work. But now it would make sense to put it on the y-axis as well. And if we 
use the same logic we used here, where if the difference in x, then our other case would be an else, we know that at that point we can say, well, if the x is not greater than the y's, then that means we'll be updating our y's. So we can just simply use an else. We don't have to write out more stuff, but I'll put a comment in of enemy is farther away on the y axis so that we know kind of what we're doing here. And now this becomes uh, very much a literal repeat of py is greater than y, speed y is equal to one, is that if py, the player's y, is greater than the enemy's y, that means the player is further down or lower on the screen. So we need to add to the enemy's position to have it start chasing the player. And then we know the converse is going to be speed y is equal to negative 1. And once you put that in, you can start to go in. Well, notice that the enemy is capable of moving in a 45 degree angle. Because when it gets into that right position, it starts moving at a 45 until it lands on top of the player. To limit it, that means if I'm moving on the x-axis, I don't want to be moving on the y-axis at all. So I can just kill my speed y. But if I'm moving on the y-axis, I don't want to be moving on the x, so I'll kill my speed x. Now, let's see, it only moves very much like an old 8-bit video game style of movement. Every now and again you can find just that precise location where it does the stair-stepping, but it's going to primarily move only in uh, X or Y so it won't start 45ing and it gives a much cleaner style of movement. In the stub file you'll see there is the intersect function. The intersect function currently is taking player and enemy. So this intersection is concerned about player and enemy and just like in our drop game, it returns a Boolean value of true or false. Um, it had to return something initially, otherwise um, processing rejected it if I just left this empty. So that's why it says return true right now. But we're not doing anything with it yet, so it doesn't really matter. But by taking these two objects, we have player and enemy looking inside their classes Let's we'll see, they all have x, y's width and heights. x, y width and height. Anytime you're doing any type of visual programming, it's pretty much a given that the object that you're putting on screen will need to have an x and a y and a width and a height because you will need that for the different programming that you're doing. So it's pretty much just anytime you do a visual object, assume you will give it an x, y width and height. That's just normal. So now what we need to figure out is the how to write out the whole half width, half height, x's and y's uh, gobbledygook. And it looks uglier than it is. I'm just going to put throw that out right now. Um, sometimes it it's you know you can write it out where you have intermediary variables like. So I'm, not, I'm just going to show a for instance and delete this so you don't need to type it as well. But I would say float player f width is equal to p dot w divided by 2. So you have these. And sometimes you may even encode inside the classes you will put in your half width and half height values. So you'd have access to those as well. But 
We know that the player's half width is p dot w divided by 2. Players, because we're passing the player object to this function, and then we're shorthanding it with p, and we'll say p dot w, because player we know has a w, and we divide it by 2. That gives us the player's half width. So I'm just going to leave that there as a visual reminder of that's kind of how we'll work with this. So if the player's half width plus the enemy's half width. So we're going to compare if that value, so the sum of their two half widths, we're comparing that. And it needs to, we will need it in parentheses. So if the sum of that is greater than the player's x minus the player enemy's x. So if their half widths added together are greater than the x of the player minus the x of the enemy. Now the one hitch is we're probably going to have to use our absolute value again because we care about the absolute value of this. Otherwise this would only work when the player is to the right of the enemy. As soon as the player is to the left of the enemy then this would fail because then we're getting very large negative numbers. So we can just put in a simple ABS. So when the half widths added together are greater than the distance between the two objects, we know they're intersecting on the x-axis. Now, we're also going to need to verify, because that now only takes care of one axis, now we need to do the y-axis. The y-axis is going to be the same, but with heights and y. So p dot h divided by 2 plus the e dot h divided by 2 when that is greater than the absolute value of the player's y minus the enemy's y. So if both of those equations are true, that tells us that an intersection has occurred. So now we just need to put all of this into a big if statement. Say if so if if all of that return true, otherwise if that's not true. That means they're not intersecting, so we can just simply say return false. So when we call the intersect function, if it's true, it will give us back true. If it's false, it will give us a false. Now if we run our program right now, nothing new will happen. You can run it to make sure you're not getting any error messages, that you didn't mistype this ugliness here of half width plus half width x and y x minus y half height plus half height y minus y and it it's ugly looking but when you break it down it's not so bad so now that we know intersect is here, we haven't verified if it actually works yet or not because we've never called it. So we're going to make the enemy tint itself when it's intersecting the player. So we can say if intersect, and then we're saying what, and we'll pass to it player, enemy, remembering that the intersect function is expecting two objects to be passed to it, one of the class player, one of the class enemy. So if intersect is true, at that point I want tint to show up and I will tint my image 
transparent blue. Else, tint will be 255. So if intersection is happening, it's going to tint. Now later on, we can use this. So if intersecting happens, we could affect a score. We could affect lives. We could end the game, change the state. All of those things that we did in the drop game, we could now have happened, which is, you know, this is just like what we did with intersect in the drop game. But it, with images, it's more fun to kind of sometimes change the color. So when they're intersecting, we can see how it turns blue. And now I can see how close it has to get. And you can watch that it happens before the pixels actually touch. But the reason for that happening is if I look at these pictures, we will see that there is some gap because it's measuring based on this edge and width of the image. It's measuring based on you know, when those two things hit. Look how much white space is around this airplane. Because the airplane does not fill the image completely, the intersection is occurring when that white space hits. So we could either change our artwork or we could change some of the properties of the image inside the class, specifically of the player and of the um, enemy.